according to the cloud. <clears throat> Okay, we've got uh, almost out of a quorum. Let's give it a few more minutes. <laughs> we can open up the floor for discussion. I have a couple of quick announcements to make, but I'll hold off until a few more folks show up. Any, uh, you know, what you may have gotten the note from me earlier uh, from Canvas. I like to carve out 15, 20 minutes at the beginning of each class as follow up to discuss uh, anything you want, uh, issues from the last lecture, the last few lectures, anything you are interested or curious about uh, with regard to pharmacology and pharmaceutical marketing. And I like to do that at the beginning of each class before we launch, launch into the lecture for the evening. So this is your time. Um, any questions or follow-ups? Anna. Hi, Dr. Sigarnik. Um, so I was just wondering that, um, like, what is done with the drugs that are not successfully marketed? Like, do the companies still try to, like, market them afterwards? Or, like, what happens to those drugs? Drugs that aren't successfully marketed from the very beginning? Yes. No, there's no yeah. one size fits all. Drugs fail for a number of reasons. They fail because they have a side effect that was not apparent in the limited number of patients in clinical control trials. You know, once you take a drug and put it into, let's say, a thousand or two thousand patients in a clinical trial, phase three trial, you may not see what, what the reality is when you put into a million people who have heart disease or some form of cancer. And so often drugs fail because a serious adverse event that was not apparent in the clinical studies uh, emerges during uh, real world use. That's why today RWE, real world evidence is a very big piece of the uh, mix of what I do and need to consider as part of the um, journey or the life cycle of any drug. Sometimes drugs fail commercially. <laughs> they are outcompeted. I think you saw that uh, Levitra, though I think it was the most effective pharmacologically and clinically and tough to treat patients with erectile dysfunction, failed commercially and really was withdrawn in most parts of the world. A couple of places still use it, I think, as a generic uh, cheap drug, but not many compared to the competitors who outmarketed them. So drugs fail for any number of reasons. Um, those are just a couple that I can think of on the top of my head. What a good question. Thank you. Who else? Somebody else have their hand up? Um, yeah, I had a question. It was more of like a curiosity question. So it was tied along to- Can you go on screen or, or tell us who you are? Oh, sorry, this is Carmen. I think my camera should be on. Yeah. I would appreciate it if whoever speaks goes on camera. Yeah, I think my camera is on. Can you not see me? I see it. Okay. okay. Um, so I had a question regarding this lecture about NSAIDs. So I am anemic and I know from a lot of doctors that they tell me to like steer clear of taking these too much. Um, but while I was looking, I just was curious. So I was looking at the warning signs on the bottles and that is nowhere to be found. Like them warning you, oh, if you're anemic, you should not take these. So I was just curious, like, how do you, um, decide what, kind of side effects get put on the bottles and what doesn't? Like, is there a threshold it needs to meet? Just more curious. So uh, almost any side effect needs to be listed somewhere, even in the label. Um, but rare, more unusual or rare side effects may not be, and you may have to really dig. Um, and, you know, the incidence of anemia with NSAIDs or hemolytic anemia does occur, but it's not that common. Um, and why that happens, nobody really knows, but you definitely should avoid NSAIDs uh, typically if you've got this form of anemia. There are different kinds of anemia. I'm not an expert in anemia, 
but if you stop the drug, it should help resolve the problem. If the anemia is strictly, well, your, your, your anemia is probably not just NSAID related, right? It's more generalized. Yeah, generalized. Yeah, yeah it's not really a common side effect, and I, I've not seen it before, actually. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, Ashley? Hello. So my question was regarding last week's lecture. I know that it was mentioned that certain races or ethnicities seem to be a little bit more susceptible to diabetes. And I wasn't sure if there was like a reason for that or if they know why that's the case. Um, no, there's no clear etiology that ties certain ethnicities or races. Uh, there are, they are tied, but we don't know why exactly. Um, type 2 diabetes is tightly related to body mass index, food choices, exercise. So uh, I, I, I don't know enough about different ethnicities and races to say whether they are more or less prone to um, weight gain or food choices. But uh, I think in any group of people, take 100 people anywhere, and the heavier people who don't exercise are going to be much more prone to insulin resistance of any race, uh, of any denomination, et cetera. Okay, thank you. I did have like a follow-up question as well. Um, yeah. The side effects were mentioned, one of them for insulin was weight gain. And it seems that like if someone were to gain weight, it would make diabetes like in fact worse. So wouldn't that be kind of compounding the issue? Sure does. I think I pointed that out last week where you can get a 20 plus kilogram, like enormous weight gain over time with insulin. You can gain two to two, three kilograms. That's three to six pounds a year. So yeah, it definitely works contrary to your objective. Um, so insulin is a problem uh, for sure in people with type two. Type 1 diabetes, not as much because that's not really related to insulin resistance at all. It's related to insulin deficit at the synthesis point in the um, pancreas, uh, autoimmune attack. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Alexandra? I have more of like a clinical question. So I have a patient who's on metformin and Ozempic. I was just wondering what would be the reason for somebody to be on both medications like that? And, and I'm assuming the patient has type 2 diabetes? Yes. Yeah, well, metformin's been around for 60 years. It's it's pretty well known. It's pretty safe um, and effective. And Ozempic works through the incretin GLP-1 system. So there's no there's no pharmacologic reason you can't use them together because metformin works through a different mechanism of action. So they're not directly co uh, conflicting or even added. They could be added in terms of their effects on uh, sugar and A1C. So they would be on those drugs in, in part because, you know, we, we typically attack diabetes, type 2 diabetes, with more than one drug out of the gate today. So it just doesn't work otherwise. So there's no conflict with a GLP-1 uh, agent and uh, a metformin. Uh, Omar? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about the commercialization failure thing that you were talking about. When a medication goes generic, how does that affect brand name drugs in terms of their profits and, uh, you know, profitability? Yeah. So if a company can't extend their, their patent beyond the duration of the original patent granted, um, and there are ways they try to do that through minor modifications and so forth, uh, variations in delivery systems. And we'll talk about that uh, at a later date. Isn't that what Gilead did with uh, Truvada and Vescovi, I think? Yeah, ma many have. There are many formulations that are modified that are, allow you to get an extension of seven years or more. Um, not the whole patent over again, but an extension on the patent. Um, but uh, your question again was what? How does that affect the profitability? Like, for instance, if a generic comes out, it's if over? You're, 
compared if you go from branded to generic, you'd lose 80, 90 percent of your profit that night. Oh, uh, because I know that like for instance, like from our erectile dysfunction lecture and all that, I know that there are companies like Kim's now that like sell generic erectile dysfunction then. So I was kind of like curious how does that affect the brand names then? Significantly. Uh, unless you've got some selective advantage greater efficacy, greater safety, some modification that makes it more easy, easier to take, you'll lose 90% of your, your revenue overnight. Uh, okay. and so, you know, <laughs> you could argue on the one hand that makes many drugs after their patent life, after the originator, the inventor, the <laughs> investors get their investment back, return on their investment for the first, let's say it takes 10 years to get the drug to market and then they have 10 years of of relative patent exclusivity, in those 10 years, if it's a blockbuster, it's doing huge revenue, hundreds of millions of dollars, little billions of dollars a year, some of these drugs. But then okay. it goes down to being more, you know, where, where, where anyone, hopefully, and everybody can access them, and that seems appropriate. Yeah, I see. All right. Good question. Uh, Alu? Yes, hi, my name is Olu Atoyin, or Olu. Um, my question was just about last week's lecture. Um, I was just confused about this part. Like, is there a particular time or stage when Levermere or Lantus is primarily marketed, like um, before there are adverse effects like diabetic foot, or it's at any point um, or stage in diabetes? So, so Lantus and Levamir are the basal long-acting, 24-hour long-acting insulins, right? As we discussed, Lantus and Levamir from Sanofi and so forth. Um, and they are, um, you know, they're used in reserve in type 2 diabetes. Typically, you don't want to use insulin out of the gate. Most of the problems associated with it. And people feel that they failed. They couldn't manage diet and exercise. They couldn't maintain their oral medications properly. <laughs> so uh, insulin is really a last resort in type two diabetes. So in terms of if your question is when in the journey of a patient of type two would insulin, would Levamir or Lantus come in, it would be hopefully never, but eventually probably likely uh, or after 10 or 15 or 20 years of having type 2 diabetes. In, increasingly, the pancreas is failing. The organ is failing. The isles of Langerons that synthesize um, insulin don't produce it anymore. And so almost no matter what you do, if you live long enough, you're going to end up on insulin. Two-thirds of patients these typically do. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Is it okay to call you Alu? Yes, that's fine. It's easier. Okay, thank you. Michaela. Hi, um, I just have a question about last week's lecture. Um, I just wanted a clear understanding on how like the farm industry works with um the different health healthcare providers when developing new like medications and treatments. Like, is it like a trial and error process or yeah, that's my question. Well, Healthcare providers, top experts in diabetes, are recruited to work with pharmaceutical companies in the clinical testing. So it's an entire industry where independent key opinion leaders, KOLs, we call them, or something like that, are paid a certain amount of dollars per patient to recruit their patients to enroll in with their patients' full consent in a clinical trial. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one are where drugs are studied for their safety and dosing in healthy human volunteers. Phase two is the first time a drug is put into a small population of patients who have the condition or the disease, a couple of hundred in one or two centers, looking at efficacy and safety. Phase three are typically multi-center randomized controlled trials with hundreds if not thousands of patients. Those patients come out of research centers, hospitals, clinics, where doctors recruit patients into clinical trials every day, all the time. It's a big business. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's interesting. Yes, to, thank you. To, to, to I, looking at the world through your your eyes, it's it's mm -hmm. interesting for me to realize that that's not 
um, known to you. <laughs> so wait, I just have one more thing. So like in recruiting those patients, like do they have, they have a choice, right? Whether or not they want to partake in the study or... You're talking about a, any patient recruited into a clinical trial? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's totally voluntary. Yes, okay. And they're given free medication and they're given you yes. some fee for transportation and maybe yes. some money for their troubles and their time. But it's not a money-making proposition. It's just, uh, and you don't know if you're on the active drug or placebo. Right, right, right. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's an altruistic thing to do for people to do that. But clinicians, MDs, PhDs, PharmDs, they, they run those trials for universities typically, but sometimes just clinics. Thank you. You bet. Uh, let's see, uh, Jason. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm sorry. Am I visible? Yeah, we see you. You're on. Okay. So I just have a question about um, when a drug is no longer, when the patent runs out, and now other pharmaceutical companies can make their own edition of the drug. Um, I've come to notice from, from things I've read and from friends, for example, that take a medication that was made by whomever. And then when the patent runs out, other people start making that drug. And for example, like a pharmaceutical company like Malincrot starts making that version. And then the, the person starts getting it from Malincrot and they get adverse effects. It's the same drug, but they get an adverse effect from another carrier. Like it, like, do these people who make the generics, are they adding in other additives or things like that that might be causing harm or? Well, they typically don't, uh, but the FDA does allow plus or minus 10% variability in the, <clears throat> in the active ingredient. So, so some, most of the time that doesn't make any difference, but in some conditions, hormonal conditions, for example, if you are hypo or hyperthyroid and you're taking thyroid replacement hormone, 10% variation in your thyroid hormone level can be quite clinically relevant. So part of the answer, Jason, to your, to your excellent question is, is the FDA will approve a generic version as long as it's within 90 to 110% consistent chemically with the parent compound, the originated compound. The world of generics has gotten much more complicated in the past decade by virtue of the fact that many drugs are not simple um, proteins or synthetics, they're, they're polypeptides, they're biologics, they're immunologics, you know. Um, uh, so these are very difficult drugs to reproduce. They're, they're genetically reproduced. Uh, they require tremendous sophistication and viral vectors and so forth. So biosimilars is a very big piece of the industry today that are generic like form of the TNF inhibitors, um, Remicade, Enbrel, for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, et cetera, Crohn's disease. And there are others, there are many others. <laughs> so today when we talk about generics, the bigger question is what, what about biosimilars? And they tend to be about half the parent, the uh, originator cost because it's still complicated and expensive to make a biologic through uh, DNA a replication, the genetic or, or genetic uh, sequencing. Yeah, uh, Emma. My question has to do with the um, PD-5 inhibitor lecture. And I know like when we talked about it, um, the Letrovir, like they were comparing it with a placebo. And I know you kind of said, like, don't ask questions you don't want answers to, but do they ever do studies where they do directly, because they were kind of saying, you know, the Latriva works better in uh, those compromised populations um, that have more side effects or other yeah. core morbidities. So my question is, do they ever do a side-by-side -side with two direct drugs to, you know, kind of use science to prove our drug is indeed better? Yeah, we'll see some of that. It's not done too often, surprisingly. It's a, it's, a, it's a good observation. FDA doesn't require it to get approval. And if you do the study and you fail, you still have to publish it and go public, and you're not going to like that. These multi-million dollar trials. A phase three trial is $20, $30 million or more. So, you know, you'll see it in the overactive bladder lecture where drugs were compared to active comparators. 
in some cases when you've got a dominant market leader, you really kind of have to if you want to take them on and you think you're going to be able to. What you'll find is that companies often set up primary endpoints in clinical trials that are called non-inferiority endpoints that are easy to hit. It's the secondary endpoints that they really want to talk about. If you miss your primary endpoint in trial, it's not ethical statistically to talk about the rest of the data. So they set up these low bar, easy to hit, non-inferior, uh, Vesicare is non-inferior to tilteridine, uh, anticholinergics in, in overactivate. You'll see when we get to that lecture. And, and that's because they set it up to see if you know overactive biosymptoms are reduced and they're all equally as good. But now let's talk about what we really want to talk about, the secondary endpoints, you know, whatever those things are, there's all kinds of secondaries. But if you don't hit the primary, you, you can't even talk about the study ethically. So they do sometimes, but not often, not often. I think that Levitra might have had more success had they done that in the tough to treat patient population, to your point, patients with heart disease and diabetes and um, post-prostate cancer, prostatectomies, where men have real problems with sexual function. So, um, yeah, that's what that's 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 the reality of it. <clears throat> okay, these are great questions. Let's keep going. We I see more hands. We'll, you know, I, we do have a lecture tonight. I need about an hour, so we'll we'll have to go another far. And I do have a couple of quick uh, housekeeping things to go over with you before we jump in. Um, Pithana. Hi. Um, so I have a really quick question. So about like uh, diabetes and I know like um, I know a couple of people that are on metformin currently, but they have like the side effects of like their skin pigmentation becoming really dark. But I also know some people that don't have this problem. So do you know why like that's like it's a side effect that I've never really learned about until now and I don't really hear it being talked about as like a very big side effect of diabetes. So do you know why that happens to some people and why some people don't have it? I don't, a... I really don't know. It's a good question. Why don't you look that up and report back to us next week? Okay, because I don't know. I, I don't think it's the diabetes per se that's causing that. I think it's something about the their um, genetic profile. Okay. You know, whatever they're expressing. But that would be fascinating to know. I know, I, know, I have no idea. Okay. Even I learned from you guys. Tessa? Um, hi, I had a quick question. So a friend of mine works at, um, she works at a medical spa and they sell like Ozempic for weight loss. So obviously the people can't get it covered by the insurance. So she told me that they get it like compounded through a pharmacy so um, they could sell it like people can pay a lot less money. And I was just wondering if compounding it was like, is that making the generic form or how they're able to sell it for cheaper when the insurance? Well, uh, that's, um, that's not legal. No, it's not. Zempic is a patent protected branded agent. Okay, yeah, because I think she said it was like they make the generic version, or but I didn't know if there was a generic well, version. You can't, you know. You, okay. It's not. Uh, yeah, D don't announce the name of this company. <laughs> no, yeah, that I, it was confusing for sure. I'm just kidding, but in reality, you you you're not allowed to make produce compound or otherwise modify to bring a generic forward in the face of a branded agent. I see. Okay. But so compounding is just making the generic then, I guess? Well, compounding is a different animal, which is fine. Nothing wrong with compounding. Right. But the sometimes you need to produce an agent uh, in a different formulation for a specific need, like patients who have certain forms of um, uh, dermatological conditions have to have a gel. And a certain okay. drug like acrolimus, tacrolimus only works if it's in a gel form. And if it's not available, it can be compounded. Mm -hmm. So compounding has its place, um, but it has to be done within the patent laws and the um, exclusivity criteria of, of the drug companies. Okay. Yeah. No, that just seemed off to me. That's why I was curious. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, your instincts are right. If it, All right. Thank if it's you. Funny, it, it probably is. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Tenzin? Hi, sorry, I'm outside and it's very dark, but um, a discussion point and a question. So discussion because earlier Omar talked about patency 
And I remember last time I brought up J and uh, last week I brought up J and J and TV drug, and you said uh, talk about it next week. So I did some research and I learned that J and J wanted to extend their second patency for the TB drug that they had since 2012. Uh, so it's been a decade, but because of the whole debate, they have now decided to let the generic drugs also be produced and provided in the market. So when it comes to profitability, now they're having to sell the drugs that they have been selling for a much higher price and now available in middle and low income countries at a very like $100 for TB drug. And by 2030, they're expect, expecting to eradicate the um, TB globally. So I think that's a very yeah. good um, ambition. Thank you for the feedback and for the report. So that's a virtuous cycle, I would say. In my view, mm -hmm. I think as a capitalist in America, we should re reward invention and creativity and allow people to make significant money uh, for a period of time, not forever. Because at the end of the day, the National Institutes of Health support much of the basic preclinical research that pharmaceutical companies pick up on, and that's taxpayer funded. So at some point, the taxpayer has to get a virtuous return on their taxpayer investment. So it's okay if a pharmaceutical company spends a half a billion dollar, 500 million on bringing a drug to market that they learned about through the National Institutes of Health funding mechanisms through, through tax, taxpayer money, as long as after the exclusivity period for the patent runs out, it comes back and most people can afford to, to get it done. Not a perfect system, but it's the best system we have anywhere in the world because maybe I was out of school that day, as I said to you in the first lecture, but I don't see these kinds of drugs that would break through mechanisms for rare treatment resistant diseases being developed almost anywhere else in the world but the US and a couple of Western European countries. Nowhere. Unless somebody can tell me otherwise, that's my point of view. Uh, there are some chat points here. Let me just uh, quickly get to those. So I won't ignore you guys. I, I apologize. Um, can we say the principal reason Salam asked for pharmaceutical companies to look out for profit is to recoup their big capital investments they put out? Yeah, well, I think so. But they're, they're for profit public companies for the most part looking to make and to give a big return to their investors and stockholders and their principals. And that's how business works, but it can't be forever. And it's not in type two diabetes does genetic genetics do play a role, but what, what it is, is not exactly clear. If there is a genetic basis, how much lifestyle change lifestyle has a limited effect, right? Exercise and diet only goes so far. So that, so you're fighting your own genetic predispositions. Mustafa asks, is the point of pharmaceutical companies tell people, or make money from selling the drug because the point was to help people. Why would they want to pay? I have no illusion that drug companies are there just to help people. I think they're there to make money. Now, they're also happy to help people, but I don't think that's the motivation of Pfizer or Novartis necessarily. They put it on their masthead. We're here to help people be as healthy as they can be. Yes, that's true, but it runs in parallel do they also want to maximize the return for their investors and their shareholders? So those things are somewhat in conflict, but also somewhat aligned in my point of view. But they're definitely not altruistic companies just trying to save the world, no. If a particular drug research and clinical trials done in developing countries, will those countries be beneficiaries of the drug? Yeah, if, if, if developing countries are bringing forward their, their own drugs through their own pipeline, they will be marketed in those countries. The question is, where are those breakthrough drugs in, you fill in the blank, India, Africa, China, Russia, Pakistan, whatever. I don't see it. Not that they're not smart people. They are. They're brilliant scientists. They just don't have the infrastructure or the history or whatever we do in this country that makes us unique, good, bad, and sad, uh, to, to be entrepreneurial, to think outside the box. I don't know what that magic formula is, but I don't see it in the rest of the world. If a patient is in a coma, do clinicians decide to volunteer the patient to proceed in a clinical trial? No. Uh, no. 
I've never heard of that, nor would that be ethical in my my view. Okay, well, all good. Um, I think it's time to get to tonight's lecture, unless there's any other burning issues. I do have a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I did mention, so thank you for jumping in. I think this makes it fun for me and interesting for you, I hope, to have these kinds of um, discussions. I, I learn a lot, and I hope you do as well. And please do follow up people who are doing some research each week at the beginning of class. Just jump in. There is a bulletin board on Canvas. It hasn't been used much, but if you want to have ongoing discussions like of the kinds of questions you're asking now, you go for it. I mean, I'll look at it. If you ask me a question or whatever, I'll jump in, moderate a bit, but it's a way of trying to keep the uh, interest um, and awareness going throughout the week, if you want. It's not required. A couple of uh, timing issues I have coming up, just to mention to you, thinking way ahead, because there aren't that many lectures in this. There's eight lectures on the final exam. But I'm traveling on Tuesday, October 17th, out of town. So I won't be able to give the lecture that Tuesday night. So I'm going to offer it on Monday night when I am in town. So I'm out the rest of the week out of town. And I know that could be a conflict for some or many of you, but I will record it. And so just go on Canvas and listen to the lecture. Even if there's just a dozen people, you'll get the same points. Um, you can always follow up with me afterwards with any questions. And I will always tell you what I'm looking for for the final. So there'll be no uh, mystery about what the key takeaway is for any lecture. So just make a note. Uh, I'll probably just set up a single Zoom for October 16th on a Monday at 7 p.m., I'm not going to delete the one on the 17th because I tried it and I, it deleted the entire recurring series and it's just a pain. So just, I won't be there on the 17th. I'll do a lecture on the 16th. Whoever can join, great. If you can't because you've got other commitments, I get it. Don't worry about it, but do listen to the lecture because there'll be at least one question on that um, next to last uh, lecture, I believe that is, on the 16th, not the 17th. And I'll remind people again. The last lecture will be on the 24th of October on proton pump inhibitors and the launch of Nexium, I believe. And then the final session, which I will have a Zoom, is on the 31st of October. I'll send you the exam through Canvas. You'll all pick it up. You can do it online while I'm there if you have general questions or not. You don't have to be online for it. Um, I'm having a foot surgery that Monday. So I may be a little loopy. It's a big Achilles tendon surgery, an issue I've had for many years. I probably have to deal with it. It's too painful. So I, I'm going to have a pretty big foot surgery on the 27th of October, but I'm not lecturing on the 31st. 24th, I'll be fine, right? <clears throat> uh, 27th is my surgery. The 31st, you're just going to get the exam. So I don't have to lecture if I'm uh, you know, a little loopy still from the surgery. It, it won't matter. So uh, any questions about that? I'll, I'll remind everybody again. The main thing is I'm going to move the October 17th, Tuesday, to the Monday the 16th. Don't worry if you can't make it. Just listen to the recording when you can over a weekend or whatever. Uh, and the other will be on the 24th and then the 31st for the test. Chat. Do we have to finish the exam in the class hours? I get that question a lot. No, you don't. You know, and I don't really care if you open book, close book. You either know it or you don't. You, you can't fool me. I, I know this stuff inside out. They're my cases, right? I'm trying to help you understand the lessons about medical marketing from a pharmacological perspective. I need you to show me that you understand those as well, because that's how you'll apply them in your careers going forward. That's my objective in this course. So finish it the next day, whatever. You know, if you've got extenuating circumstances, just let me know. You don't have to send it in. And many do that evening. Um, but listen, again, like I said from the beginning, this course is for you. You're all going to be doctors, graduate students. You're not kids. I'm not going to treat you like kids or children. Do what you want. And just send me your exams whenever you can. If you're going to be more than a day or two late, you've got to let me know. Uh, because I have uh, requirements to grade you. And once I start the grading, the clock is ticking, okay? And I know, you know, I don't want to put extra pressure on you. You've got other things in your lives, other classes, I get it. 
I've been there. So just do what you want to do. Do what you think is right for you so that you can make this course important so, so it stays with you in the future. However, if you don't, if you want to do a formal hour and a half closed book because that's how you roll, terrific. If you want to hand it in the next two or three days because you're, 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 you're stressing, don't stress. Take your time. Just learn it and show me that you get it. All right? Does everybody understand that? Does everybody have any questions about that? Really important. All right. So let's go into tonight's discussion. It's a really interesting one um, tonight about the COXU specific inhibitor. And you guys got to know the difference between specificity and selectivity. Specificity, who's going to tell me what spe specific is versus selective? Who's going to tell me? Specific is to the receptor. Selective is to the tissue. You got to know that. Because that's important for this lecture. It's important for the PDE5 lecture. Specific inhibition of cyclooxygenase. And I was on the side of uh, Vioxx, which, as you know, is no longer available on the market. We'll talk all about that. I'm going to go pretty fast tonight because I have a bunch of slides. I'm going to jump through them pretty fast. If you have any questions, you know, we're going to do this as we always do. We'll do disease state, health of physiology, the unmet need the pharmacology, and then how that was applied with Merck, with Vioxx, and Pfizer with Celebrex, which is still on the market. So inflammation is a fascinating topic. And this slide is just to say that there are many pathways that lead to inflammation and its inhibition. Plasma proteins, complement, phospholipase A2, cytokines, prostaglandins and prostanoids, histamine, all kinds of stuff. We're interested in non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that can be both analgesic, pain relieving, <laughs> and antipyretic. And at high doses, anti-inflammatory. And we'll talk more about that because there's a big source of confusion with NSAIDs. They're not anti-inflammatory unless one maintains a high plasma level for 24 hours. And we'll talk about why that's an important concept. And Tylenol, acetaminophen, is analgesic, is uh, not anti-inflammatory, but is analgesic and antipyretic through the central nervous system. So that we're not talking about acetaminophen Tylenol tonight, for the most part. So these are the non-selective cyclooxygenase inhibitors. You may recognize some of those here: naproxen or naproxen, um, ibuprofen. You've you've seen many of these before: meloxicam, Mobic, and the selective COX-2 inhibitors. Maybe that should be specific, the celecoxib and rofocoxib. This pathway is important in the sense that you need to understand how these are regulated from the cell membrane of inflammatory tissues. So phospholipids, the, um, the cyclical uh, protein phospholipid carbohydrate core of any cell has, um, uh, has uh, arachidonic acid embedded in the uh, in the, in the core in the lipophilic core of the tissue, and that can be uh, phospholipase A two releases arachidonic acid, makes it free arachidonic acid, and that, that then gets quickly converted by cyclooxygenase into these endoperoxides, which are very rapidly converted to from by these other enzymes, thromboxane synthase into the thromboxanes, which are platelet aggregatory and vasoconstrictive, or prostacyclin synthase, which is just the opposite, anti-aggregatory and vasodilatory. That's why low-dose aspirin preferentially shifts the inhibition in favor of prostacyclin. So you end up inhibiting the bad uh, intermediaries uh, the vasoconstrictive intermediaries, when you use very low doses of aspirin. And that's why a small dose of aspirin are used for cardiac protection as opposed to uh, standard uh, 300 plus uh, millimeters. Pharmacologically, they're very diverse. They all inhibit cyclooxygenase. That's how they work to, to reduce the release of arachnid. Steroids, I should mention, are the most potent. Prednisone, methylprednisolone, and others. Um, they work by um, inhibiting the release of arachidonic acid. 
from the C2 position of the membrane phospholipids. So if you don't release the free arachidonic acid, thank you, steroids, you don't go down this pathway to stimulate. Um, that's how they're anti-inflammatory. Inhibition of prostate synthesis is responsible for the therapeutic effects of NSAIDs through inhibition of cyclooxygenase. But in the gut, in the gastric mucosa, gastrointestinal damage is done through inhibi inhibiting the gut protective form of prostaglandin E1. PGE1 is gut protective. And when you inhibit it, you end up with potential problems, including perforations, ulcerations, and bleeds, which we're going to talk a lot about tonight. So common adverse effects, you can get some additional bleeding, peptic ulceration, um, ulceration uh, and bleeds, renal problems, water retention and edema, which is probably what happened with, with Vioxx, some nephropathy in the kidneys, etc. So those are the side effects. And, and this is kind of an important concept that cyclooxygenase, it, it turns out, exists in, in a couple of different forms in, in tissues, in potentially inflammatory tissues, in the constitutive form, COX-1 is, is, is gut protective. But at the site of inflammation, cytokines stimulate the induction of the isoform COX-2. And COX-2 is the mediator of inflammation. And so the, so the ability of NSAIDs to inhibit inflammation is a function of their ability to inhibit COX-2. COX-1 inhibition is not a good thing because that ends up reducing the gut protective effects of PGE-1. So we're going to come back to this in a minute because this is an important point. So inhibition of COX-1, the constitutive pathway, is responsible for the gastrointestinal damage via reduced prostaglandin E1. We'll talk about that more in a few moments. And there, are an awful, there were an awful lot of agents out there, some were more COX-2 specific than others, similar efficacies, but different side effects, particularly the bleed rates. This is a cartoon that speaks to the what I was just talking about, the cyclooxygenase enzymes. Remember, <laughs> the cyclooxygenase is right here. This is where the NSAIDs work. They inhibit cyclooxygenase. So they prevent the conversion of arachidonic acid into the uh, prostaglandin precursors and the peroxides that go down these pathways. So we inhibit cyclooxygenase. And the physiological stimuli, the constitutive, is the housekeeping, is the good stuff. So you really don't want to lose your protective PGEs in your platelets, in your endothelium, in your stomach, in your kidney. The inflammatory stimuli pathway is through the inducible COX-2 through the macrophages, leukocytes, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells that we do want to inhibit. So by using just non-specific NSAIDs, we're inhibiting both. And guess what? You may get anti-inflammatory effects, analgesia, antipyretic antipyret effects. You're also going to cause ulcerations, bleedings, and perforations because you're knocking out both. And this is the brilliant part of what happened with the COX-2 specific inhibitors. You can see where this is going. I'm going to run through a few of these things pretty quickly now. Um, the prostaglandins, the PGE1s, basically stimulate mucosal bicarbonate secretion, vasodilation on the cytoprotective on that basis. Aspirin, therefore, induces mucosal injury by inhibiting the protective effect of the prostaglandins of the E series, reducing bicarbonate and mucosal protection, secretion, et cetera. Now, we talk about aspirin use in unstable angina and clearly, there's a significant risk reduction over time in patients who have had a heart attack. If you look at the occurrence of cardiac death and non-fatal MIs, those who take aspirin have a dramatic reduction over two years. Okay, that's good. And the reduction in MI and death is clearly related to aspirin and not other agents they're taking like heparin, because you see the difference here. Placebo aspirin, heparin placebo, clearly 
that's not protective. Heparin clearly is protective here, whereas heparin alone and plus aspirin doesn't make a difference. So it's not the heparin that's cardioprotective, it's the aspirin. And this is proof positive of that. Now, control trials have looked at low doses of aspirin for the prevention of cerebral and cardiovascular events. And the problem is because these are non specific and somewhat non selective agents, you start to see with increasing doses of aspirin, increasing bleed rates, GI bleed rates, and that the odds ratio is consistent with the dosing. The higher the dose of aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, the higher the odds ratio of uh, admission for a bleeding ulcer. And there are other risk factors that, that mitigate or mediate this effect. In fact, uh, drinking alcohol doubles it. Um, Over-the-counter NSAIDs on top of prescription NSAIDs, people don't know what they're taking. Uh, NSAIDs, OTC plus prescription plus alcohol quadruples the rate. So there are other risk factors. And the risks are perforations, ulcerations, and bleeds, pumps, obstruction, strictors. You could bleed out. You can have kidney failure. Peptic ulcer hospitalization rates, look at the gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer rates um, as they've occurred over time, hemorrhagic uh, and perforations. So clearly this is an ongoing problem. This is what it looks like upon endoscopy, pretty much a hole in your gut. The prevalence of endoscopically confirmed NSAID-induced ulceration, uh, up to 30% in the stomach, up to 10% in the duodenum, Clinically significant, up to 4%. I mean, you can end up hospitalized. <laughs> Looking at risk factors for serious GI adverse events, the relative risk, certainly if you've been a bleeder before, if you're using an anticoagulant, corticosteroids, and you can see by dose and by age, relative risk increases. And upper GI bleeding, you can see whether it's prescribed or over-the-counter with aspirin, over-the-counter is used so frequently, it's a very high percentage of uh, uh, patients who present with an upper GI bleed. A little bit less so uh, with, um, with the prescribed agents. The prevalence of the over-the-counter analgesics presenting with GI bleeds, you can see here, aspirin is probably the worst, looking at upper GI, lower GI in total. This is the control on the far right. Ibuprofen, naproxen, and acetaminophen is, 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 is low, like naproxen. NSAID dose, we already talked about. It is dose responsive. GI bleeding by ibuprofen use, again, dose responsive. Um, why are patients taking over-the-counter NSAIDs for the most part? Um, how often are you using it? You can see the numbers here. Prevention, the reason for taking over-the-counter NSAIDs to prevent cardiac problems is almost 40, is, is almost half. Aches and pains, arthritis, headache, you know, reasonable reasons to be taking NSAIDs. This is an interesting um, thing that people don't, don't understand that 81, so baseline is the effect of of aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid on prostaglandin E1, which is gut protective, right? Even the lowest dose of so-called cardioprotective baby aspirin dose of 81 milligrams taken daily for secondary prevention. You don't take aspirin for primary prevention. If you've had a heart attack, you take it for secondary, but you don't take it as preventive, which is too dangerous. This is the reason. You reduce your PGEs below baseline, even at the blue level of 81 milligram baby aspirin. So it's not particularly safe to use baby aspirin every day. That's why the Preventative Service Task Force last year said, do not take low dose baby aspirin for primary prevention of cardiac disease. You're gonna end up as a bleeder, stomach, duodenum, rectum, or somewhere. Even baby aspirin, and people just don't understand that. Uh, another misnomer, coated aspirin or buffet aspirin, it doesn't matter. The relative risk is roughly the same. So baby aspirin, coated aspirin, buffered aspirin, I'm here to tell you, students, they're all particularly dangerous.
And this is the consequence. It's not trivial. 13 million chronic users, 70 million prescriptions a year. God knows how many over the counter. Gastric ulcers up to 10%. Serious GI complications up to 1.3% in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Almost 1% in osteoarthritis. And this is the take-home message. Hospitalizations for upper GI bleeds over 100,000 a year and up to a 10% mortality. If you get hospitalized for an upper GI bleed due to NSAIDs, you've got up to a 10% chance of dying. There's over 16,000 deaths every year in the U.S. alone due to NSAID-induced upper GI bleeds. It's the 15th most common cause of death in the United States, costing billions of dollars in direct and indirect costs. If, this, if these data don't blow you away, then you're not paying careful attention. This is a huge epidemiological medical problem. Is the dose-related effect of aspirin cumulative, even at the low dose of taken daily? I don't think it's cumulative. I think it's just constant insult and injury to the gastric mucosa. I don't think cumulative to me is the doses add up, and even if you, you know. No, if you take 81 milligrams baby aspirin every day, supposedly relatively safe, you're not safe. You're no more safe than taking 325 milligrams full dose NSAID. So I don't think it's a cumulative event. I think it's just a persistent effect on inhibiting PGE1, even at baby aspirin doses. So this is an important consideration for you, particularly those of you going to clinical medicine. And I'm going to come back again to this cartoon because I'm going to give you the take-home message in a minute in the next couple of slides. Remember, COX-1, constitutive housekeeping, good. COX-2, inflammatory stimuli, bad. Want to knock out COX-2 or preserve the COX-1 sparing? Yeah, who, nobody knows that the mortality from NSAID-induced upper GIP is that high. But I've studied it. You're welcome. Now you know. You go tell 10 other people. So keep this in mind. You need to basically understand this pathway for the test because this is the home run message. Let me explain. COX-2 versus COX-1 specificity. Rofococcib is Vioxx. Celecoxib is Celebrex. Vioxx, Merck, Celebrex, Pfizer. On the, on the uh, x-axis, it takes 100 micromolar in vitro of Vioxx, Rofococcid, to inhibit COX-1 versus about, call it 10 micromolar Celecoxib. To inhibit. So it takes 10 times more Vioxx to knock out the good stuff. That's protective, gut protective. On COX-2, they're roughly equivalent on the x-axis. Do I have this right? Is this the, no, the y-axis is this one. This is the x-axis, right? Yeah, horizontal. Y-axis, the COX-2 is about the same, call it you know, one micromolar for COX-2. So they're both roughly equivalent at knocking out the inflammatory pathway. But rofococcib is tenfold more COX-1 sparing, is the way of thinking about it. COX-1 sparing. And even Celebrex, if you compare it to ibuprofen or any of these other, naprosin, they're much, much safer. So this is the home run message and why this is so important to understand the pharmacology. Uh, if you didn't understand the pharmacology, you'd never understand the differences between Vioxx and Celebrex, or for that matter, nonspecific NSAIDs. Taking proton probably have a drug over with aspirin would lessen the side effects. Uh, let's say no. Um, it, it's a question that's come up many times before. Um, it's not the uh, acid per se directly, although indirectly it is. You lose, reduce the proton pump, the acid production. But if you knock out your gut protective PGE, it almost doesn't matter how much acid you have. You, you, are, you are prone, you're still gonna have acid even with a proton pump inhibitor, enough to burn a hole in your stomach. So I'm gonna say a, a tentative partial no to that. Um, in other words, I don't think, 
primary care doctors or gastroenterologists are prescribing proton pump inhibitors for patients who are necessarily on chronic aspirin for RIROA. I don't think that's a standard of care, uh, but you guys can check me on that. I could be wrong. This is another way of looking at that in vitro specificity COX-2 over COX-1 ratio. Uh, another way of looking at it here, you see, um, you see celecox of here. So to the right is COX-1 specific, to the left is COX-2 specific. And you can see rofococcib is all the way up here, much more COX-2 specific than any of these guys, like Clofenax, even Celecoxib, which is still marketed as a super aspirin. We'll come to that in a few minutes. Uh, better than meloxicam. Rofococcib was a very safe and effective drug. There are many gastroenterologists and rheumatologists who rue the day it was removed from the market. We'll talk about that in a minute. It doesn't mean it didn't cause problems. It did. Um, but the problems were identifiable in a certain specific identified patient population. So we'll talk about that. So again, let me pause here, students. This is the take-home message. You need, you're going to need to know this for the exam. What is the difference? There's going to be a question that talks about, tell me about COX-2 versus COX-1 specificity and their relative safety and explain this to me from a Vioxx and Celebrex perspective. That isn't the exact question, but I guarantee you it's something like it. And you're going to have to know this pathway, why, why knocking out COX-1 is bad and knocking out COX-2 is good. And you're going to have to understand the difference between rofococcib and celecoxib in terms of um, in terms of their differential specificity for COX one and COX two. And these couple of three slides are what will get you there. So, does anybody have any question about that? Yes. Could you no. repeat that one more time, please? <laughs> and this is being recorded, so you can play this back. But basically. What we want to do is non-specific NSAIDs knock out both of these equally. It's okay that it knocks out COX-2 and you reduce inflammation with acetylsalicylic acid therapeutic. Drug. You're also knocking out the gut protective PGE1s through the constitutive pathway. Bad. You want agents that are COX-1 sparing and COX-2 specific, knocking out only the bad stuff. And I just showed you in vitro data that says that rofococcib Vioxx is tenfold more COX-1 sparing. It takes 10 times more to knock out COX-1 than silicoxib, 100 versus 10 micromolar. That's very clear pharmacological evidence that Vioxx is tenfold more COX-1 sparing than silicoxib ever was. Same thing you can see it here. Increasingly COX-2 to the left, increasingly COX-1 to the right. Rofococcib Vioxx is up here much more COX-2 specific, COX-1 sparing, and these others are somewhat less so. All of these, look where aspirin is and indomethacin. They're all the way over to the right. They're, not, they're, they're increasing COX-1. They're knocking out too much of the good guy. So I'm gonna transition now to, to how this was applied in the last 30 minutes. So any other questions though before I do that? And, and the reason this is important for you to understand is that whether or not you work in the inflammatory space, whether you prescribe these agents or not in the future, the message here is about the basic pharmacology of drug specificity and how that's used to differentiate these agents in a clinical perspective, in a clinical context, from an efficacy and safety perspective. You're going to find many drugs in your lifetime will talk about their specificity or tissue selectivity. And you're going to need to process this and you're going to think back, oh, I remember Dr. Sigarnik talking about this with that COX-2, COX-1 business with Rock and Celebrex or PDE5 inhibitors. Very similar thinking, very similar strategy. I drove both, I built both, so that's why. But I guarantee you, um, you're going to come across this concept again in a new, different therapeutic area with a drug we don't even know about today. And you're going to remember how these things were used, how they were differentiated, I mean, you're going to be in a much stronger position to be your own advocate and judge for what's real and what's not. That's my objective for this course. Now, Searle, which is uh, gone, became part of uh, Pharmacia and ultimately became part of uh, 
Upchon and all Pfizer. The, the joke is, what's the name of the company that Pfizer took over? Pfizer. So Searle, Upchon, Pharmacia all became Pfizer. So Celebrex is Pfizer, but it started out at Searle. And I, I worked with them at the time versus Merck, and I worked with Vioxx uh, specifically. And this guy, Philip Needleman, who I knew at U U Wash U, um, he came up with the concept of this cyclooxygenase prostaglandin differential thing where they, the, the, these drugs uh, reduced pain by blocking action of cyclooxygenase. But he believed there were two types, and he developed the concept of super aspirin, which turns out not to be the case. They're not any more effective than any other NSAID. They're just safe. Now, what is also true, I'll tell you, is that because they're once a day drugs, once every 24 hours, patients are able to maintain adequate plasma levels, blood levels. So they maintain their anti-inflammatory efficacy. For you to maintain anti-inflammatory anti efficacy with aspirin or ibuprofen or naproxen, you've got to take two tabs every six to eight hours around the clock. You may have analgesic and antipyretic effects, but you won't have anti-inflammatory effects. So that's why for, for a lot of uh, uh, mistaken uh, thinking, uh, went behind a super aspirin. They're not super aspirin. If it is once a day, so you maintain, you know, are you going to wake up in the middle of the night and take two uh, Advil to maintain anti-inflammatory efficacy? I don't think so. Take one of these drugs once a day, maintain that blood level so they were potently, and people thought they were super effective. Eh, not so much. They were super safe relative to the perforations, ulcerations, and bleeds, particularly Vioxx, for the reason I showed you, that it was tenfold more top COX-1 sparing, the good psychoaxygenase, the Celebrex, or any other NSAID by far. But this became a selling point and a big marketing campaign. And this is just some of the pictures of the, the billions of dollars that was spent on the marketing of Celebrex and Vioxx. Were these really... Uh, NSAIDs really as dangerous as some of the reports suggest. Did the COX-2 specific inhibitors solve that problem? You know, pharmacologically, they don't look all that different. Look at the structure, the organic structure, look at the half-lives, <laughs> et cetera. But we did start to see that, that the upper GI effects of Vioxx, Rofacoxib, endoscopically, in patients, a lot of patients with osteoarthritis, you could see that compared to ibuprofen in the gray, the cumulative incidence of gastroduodenal ulceration at the 25 and 50 dose, which was the clinically indicated dose of Vioxx, was a lot safer from a GI bleed perspective than a high dose ibuprofen. Similarly, celecoxib, Celebrex from Pfizer, endoscopically in a lot of patients who had RA taken a whopping amount of NSAIDs, gastrointestinal ulceration incidence over 12 weeks, much lower at 200, 400, and 800 milligrams of Celebrex compared to naproxen and naproxen. Okay, that's consistent with the COX-2 specific COX-1 sparing effect of Celebrex, celecoxib, and rofacoxib based upon what I showed you. Now, the further evidence in the pivotal trials, the so-called Vigor trial for rofacoxib with Vioxx, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, clearly showed the cumulative incidence of an upper GI bleed was much lower with Vioxx versus naproxen. Uh, and um, secondary endpoints of uncomplicated. So either way you looked at it, rofacoxib looked pretty good in terms of GI bleed. Similarly, the class study for Celebrex compared to diclofenac and ibuprofen also showed uh, G upper GI complications and symptomatic ulcerations at a much lower rate. The pinky-ish color here is the lowest. So I think these data are pretty clear is the GI effect of other NSAIDs 
exaggerated because of the higher doses needed for the same effect. Um, these are these are doses used in patients who have osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. They take a whopping doses. So are they exaggerated? Maybe for the patients who's taking it for a headache, but it's not exaggerated for the patients with rheumatic disease. This is what they do. So I think, you know, if the clock stopped here, we'd say, well, we've got two terrific COX-2 specific agents, maybe box a little bit more COX-2 specific than Celebrex, but they clearly are producing fewer GI bleeds and therefore will reduce the rate of complications. But the story doesn't end there. Ah, a little cloud on the horizon. Studies start to show that there were some adverse events, hypertension reported for Vioxx. You can see at the 50 milligrams in the Vigor trial, um, you see some uh, doubling of the hypertension rates and a somewhat dose responsive increase in hypertension with Vioxx. Celebrex, mm, not as bad, not as bad. Maybe that's probably why it's still in the market. We'll come to that. Now, once they saw that hypertension rates were increased with Vioxx, they had to look further because now the heart attack rate, uh, cl clearly the rates per 100 patient years for rofecoxib at the once a day QD 50 milligram high dose versus naproxen was much higher. And a further look back at the class pivotal trial at Celebrex showed maybe a little about the same as ibuprofen, but not as bad, but a little bit worse than clofenac. So not as frightening as what apparently was happening with rofecoxib Vioxx. So the FDA convened a meeting in uh, uh, 2004, and they they did a data dredge analysis, a retrospective amount of the pivotal trials of vigor in class looking for mortality, heart attack rates. And based upon that, Merck voluntarily withdrew Vioxx based upon the data that they saw, the heart attack and hypertension rates. They reanalyzed all the COX-2 data and warning letters were put out um, and trials were discontinued. The FDA convened a safety committee of the Arthritis Advisory Board on February of 2005. Eight rheumatologists, 19 other physicians, eight statisticians, an ethicist, patient, and history rep. Does the agent pose a risk for cardiovascular events? Where is this risk benefit profile? Should it continue to be marketed? And what action should be recommended? And at that hearing, they had limited data. They didn't have additional long-term data. They had the pivotal data, which they started to see the signals in. The trials were short. The most were done without clear efficacy endpoints. They had safety endpoints, endoscopic bleeding rates, right? Um, they were observational. But the FDA hearing, and this is interesting. People, again, don't know this. When they talk about the Vioxx cellular, and this case has been written up in uh, uh, master's business programs all over the world um, that Celebrex was voted to stand the market unanimously 32 to 0. Valdecoxib, which was another cox specific agent, um, was 17 to 13, but they pulled it off anyway. Rofecoxib was 17 to 15. It was not a unanimous decision, but the FDA did decide to withdraw Vioxx based upon that 17 to 15, because ultimately the commissioner of the FDA makes the final decision. They're not um, required to follow the FDA committee uh, recommendation, but they did in the sense that certainly Celebrex still is on the market as a COX-2 specific, only marketed COX-2 specific inhibitor by prescription today. Rofecoxib or Vioxx was removed from the market, and many other NSAIDs were given black box warnings in their label and restrictions to direct consumer marketing. So the COX-2 inhibitors really are equipotent to NSAIDs from a COX-2 inflammatory inhibitor perspective. And as I said, they get that super aspirin thing because they're safer for the most part, notwithstanding the hypertension, the heart attack. But we have many drugs we've identified patients with that 
maybe if you have heart disease, you shouldn't be taking as many NSAIDs, or certainly not, not. Maybe Vioxx could have stayed on the market with a black box warning, but there were too many. There was too much momentum, and there were other problems that were encountered, which I'll tell you about in, in a moment. And here's the question: Would this be offset by the use of proton pump inhibitors? So that was a good question. Um, ultimately, the the actions announced by the FDA was what I said. Celebrex could remain on the market as a prescription drug, but with changes to its labeling and warnings. Vioxx was, um, uh, was never reintroduced. It was withdrawn from the market. And all prescription NSAIDs and over-the-counters have new, new warnings on them because of this. Any new NSAID must actually be clinically better, which they're not, than another. So it's unlikely to that we'll see another NSAID approval in our lifetimes. And so the medical marketing story here the strategy is to differentiate uh, Rofocox and Vioxx from Celecox and Celebrex based upon certainly the clinical data demonstrating reduced endoscopically confirmed perforations, ulcers, and that's true for both. And I think the in vitro data, the pharmacologic binding profile, showing that certainly um, Vioxx was tenfold more COX-2 specific, that should be specific. And, and these, the, you know, the Celebrex sales were enormous um, throughout the years into the billions of dollars, um, tailing a bit towards the end of its patent life, I suppose. I think it's still patented. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about three, three plus billion dollars a year, maybe more. I don't know what the sales, maybe somebody can look up the sales while we're talking of Celebrex over the past couple of years. And so the question for you students is, do you think Viox made its case as the COX-2 specific inhibitor with the greatest potency, efficacy, selectivity, specificity, and sensitivity? This is the very same questions I've asked you from the very beginning to think about the pharmacological basis for product differentiation is based upon some of these factors. And it's up to you to decide which ones. Certainly if the, um, the Viox and Celebrex share of the market were very similar, in the years I worked on it. Uh, but Viox um, approved in 99, generated billions of dollars in sales for the couple of years. So, and then it was full of the market in 2004 for the reasons I showed you. Uh, Merck spent a lot on direct to consumer advertising and marketing, uh, which was very popular in the late 90s. Um, every dollar spent yield $4 in sales. But Merck had some legal battles as well to fight, besides the hypertension and the heart attack data that would cause the FDA to withdraw it. Um, Merck had to plead guilty to misdemeanor charges, almost a billion dollar dollar settlement of uh, illegal marketing of paying of sales of Viox. They pled guilty to misbranding Viox uh, and paid another couple of another billion dollars to resolve civil claims. Uh, they put aside billions of dollars in legal costs and lawsuits. Even though they were winning some, they weren't winning all. And any one of them could have been billions of dollars. So the settlement resolved many of the claims. The point is that part of the problem was, this was before, when you do a clinical trial, um, Merck was accused of actually hiding or burying some of the data. That, that they might have known, some folks may have actually known about some of the, the cardiovascular side effects and just wasn't published. Today, everything about a drug has to be published. And this was really the beginning of that era, a full disclosure. If you do a study, all the data has to be revealed. And, and Viox was an example of some of the uh, legal problems that Merck saw as a result of maybe not bringing forward everything that it should have. So, uh, Questions you got. Uh, is that why we only have the NSAIDs we have now? I think so. I think that's why. Well, I don't think we have any more. Celebrex is the sixth best selling drug with sales more than four billion since it debuted. Is that still true? <laughs> is that, that's incredible. Uh, did they do four billion dollars in 2022, 2023? And, and you know, if so, I can't even do that math in my head. Is that like, you know, 13 years of four, $4 billion a year? Between Celebrex and by both being uh, specific COX-2 inhibitors, not selective. 
How did Vioxx be so different than Celebrex to cause myocardial infarction? Well, you know, it's a good question. It's We don't know exactly why, but certainly it probably had to do with edema and um, uh, water retention in patients who are prone to cardiovascular disease. And so potentially, uh, you know, at a 17 to 15 split vote, could it have been retained on the market? It was a very effective drug and clinicians loved it. I know clinicians today who stockpiled it from 24, 2004, who still have it in their stockpile that they use personally. Because it was such an effective drug, tenfold more COX-1 sparing. <coughs> so they rue the day that that happened. Because they argue, I got plenty of patients where I, I can't use certain drugs because of certain predispositions, heart disease, et cetera, whatever the condition is. So uh, that's the end of the lecture tonight, students. Any other questions or comments? I, I think this is a particularly interesting case. Uh, pharmacologic differentiation, ethical legal battles, uh, marketing battles, um, and so forth. Any other questions or comments? So are NSAIDs not safe for chronic pain? It's a tough, tough question. Um, you know, life is a, a, a balancing act, right? Chronic pain, you know, what what are your options if you've got chronic pain? Uh, I mean, I'm, I told you guys I'm about to have surgery on my heel because I have some chronic pain. I'm having uh, the Achilles tendon repaired. I'm having them open the back of my heel on October 27th, shaving some bone, which is too big, causing an insertion injury into the calcaneus, I think it's called, into the back of my heel, sewing up a tear from my years doing sports and putting two screws into my heel. I have a lot of pain today and I'm taking an awful lot of meloxicam. It's fairly COX-2 specific. It's not as good as Celebrex, not as good as Vioxx. So I'm taking a risk. I, you know, Speaking personally, I am taking a risk taking an NSAID every day. I hope after, and I won't be able to walk for three weeks, no weight from that leg for three weeks in a, in a splint, then a th four weeks in a boot. So it'll get better and I'll be fine, but I don't want to live the rest of my life with chronic pain. So I get chronic, now that's, there's a lot worse pain than that. I'm not saying that that's like, you know, the worst pain in the world, but it, every step I take hurts. And so I'm taking chronic NSAIDs right now. I'm not happy about it because I know the risk. And I don't have access to Vioxx. And I don't want to pay for Celebrex. <laughs> so, because my insurance company won't cover it. So in general, so are they safe? Um, you know, it depends. If you, it's dose dependent, it's age dependent, it's alcohol dependent. There's a lot of issues. No, that's not true because in 2000 it was, oh, okay. So, so it's really, is it, is it still patented? It's, so it's, it's 84 no, so it's dropped off quite a bit. 331. Okay, either way, it probably lost its parent protection. I would think. Yeah. All right. So it's a tough question. I do understand why the decision by the FDA was unanimous to keep celebrates, but not the others. Well, you know, I showed you some data from the class and vigor trials that showed that. Celebrex didn't cause the degree of hypertension or heart attacks that rofecoxib did. It wasn't zero, but it wasn't uh, much worse, if at all, than, than diclofenac and, and other NSAIDs. I see so many patients on baby aspirin. It's interesting to see the recent Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's particularly a, a safe alternative. I would not, not advise a patient to take it for primary prevention to prevent a first event, a cardiac event. If you've had an event, yes, then the risk of a second event is high enough so that the risk of a perforation, ulceration, bleed versus second heart attack or stroke is different. But primary prevention, no. Baby aspirin, no. Is it generic Celebrex? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. How do certain companies, despite pleading guilty to such harmful performance in the past, continue to thrive? Shouldn't we expect a decline in collaborative prior You know, it's 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 a difficult, painful uh, 
Merck, Merck, Merck paid a, tr tr a tremendous price in dollars and reputation for what happened here. And I, and, you know, I've worked with Merck. They're a very ethical company. There's a lot of wonderful people there. Um, yeah, it was a black eye. Um, you know, you got to make your own judgment. Uh, Merck's a big, big multinational company. They do an awful lot of good work, breakthrough work in, in oncology and a lot of other fields. Did they, did they get a call to task here? Sure they did. Was it for good reason? Perhaps. It's not for me to judge. Clearly, um, there were lawsuits that they lost and paid a big price for it. But I wouldn't damn them forever. You know, people need to be given a chance. And I think Merck is a terrific company, uh, has really stepped up and put things in place to make this, make certain this never happened again and never has. Uh, hands up, Annie. Hi, Professor. Um, this is kind of a dumb question, but since Biox was pulled off the market years ago, hypothetically, would they be able, or if any other company would ever be able to kind of bring it back? Or is it under the patent and it's not allowed ever? Well, the patent's gone on these agents, I think, for now. I just don't think anybody wants to put their foot in that water. So there's too much, too much um, bad blood. <laughs> too much went down, and and you know theoretically there's risk. I, I mean I'm saying maybe it could have been given to only patients who don't have hypertension or don't have heart disease, but how do you know? Half the time, patients who die of a heart attack had no prior symptoms. Yeah, because I agree. I don't like. I don't think they should have pulled off the market. Uh, Viox, because especially the part you mentioned about the specificity um, in comparison to the other drug, Viox looks a lot better. Yeah. So uh, Ambar says, it's interesting that aspirin was first made as a safer alternative, supposed to cause less GI effect, but even by adding the acetyl group, the aspirin is causing, yeah. All the NSAIDs, even, even the obviously belts, Celebrex, and, and Viox produce some bleeds, not zero. Uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, so I was thinking, despite the risks you take with taking NSAIDs and, you know, like post surgery, things like that, they, usually, they do prescribe you like those 600 milligrams, 800 milligrams. Um, I would still think that despite a risk of having a bleed, that it's still a safer or better alternative than risking using like, cause they also could prescribe you oxycodone. I don't know if, I think it would be a better idea to stick with the NSAIDs rather than going over to that. I mean, I guess it's subjective on how bad your pain is, but. I, I would agree with that generally, you know, pain is somewhat subjective. Um, today for, for doctors to even prescribe an, an, uh, an opioid, there, there often needs to be a written contract between the doctor and the patient. You know, people take this very, very seriously as they should. This has been a disaster in this country. Um, and so I, I, uh, I think you're right. I think people should, you know, I, I would, uh, I mean, I'm, I'll probably get a, a couple of opioid analgesics for my foot, but I don't want to use them. I'm afraid to use them. I'm a pharmacologist. I'm afraid to use them. Maybe I will for if I can't sleep for the first night or two, but I will, I would in a heartbeat, Jason, agree with your assessment and take, you know, high dose NSAIDs for a week or so just to get over the acute recovery phase than an opioid. But if you have to, you know, I don't want to judge people. You know, there's a lot worse pain than, you know, heel surgery pain also. I mean, you know, I, I can't speak to terrible cancer pain and other forms of, chronic pain syndromes that people suffer from. Pains are very subjective and very damaging um, phenomena. More than 11 billion, wow. Yeah, big money, high stakes. You know, the, the level of revenue that you see in oil and gas companies, in, in IT, 
And, you know, th this is the kind of money that uh, the biggest corporations in, in the world uh, produce. You know, and this is year in, year out, two, three billion dollars. For a period of time, they're, they're, mo they're printing money, practically. And I know the other side of the story in the U.S. that, you know, our prescription costs are so, so high. They are. And it prevents a lot of people from gaining access. That's a problem. Eventually, these breakthrough drugs do become generic or bio biosimilars, but not for the first few years. Unless you have terrific health care coverage and can pay for the out-of-pockets, you're not going to have access to them. So that's not necessarily fair or right, but that's the system we live in. Okay, anything else? I do have a quick question. Um, my name is Jasmine. Jasmine. Um, I had a question about like the ibuprofen and um, aspirins. Like, considering women have like their menstruals for like longer periods of time, if they are taking like the lower dosages of it for that week, let's say they are taking it like all that week, would it still have the same results, but just like in a longer period of time because it's not an everyday dosage? So let me make sure I understand your question. A woman who do you say for a woman who who's who who's menstruating could bleed? Yeah. yeah, there's definitely an increased bleed. So uh that 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 could be an issue. I, I don't I'm not an expert in that area and I would be interested in knowing more about it. Maybe you could look that up and kind of give us a little quick update next week. I mean, as far as like the GI chat, like oh. GI bleeding and everything, the charts that you gave us, like showing how progressive they are with the dosage, like considering it's not an everyday thing, it's just like, let's say that week or just the two weeks, would it be the same effects just over a longer period of time? Uh, you know, I think the risk is relative. I think that it is definitely dose responsive. So the more exposure you've got, the higher the risk, but <clears throat> for, for people who need them for different reasons, uh, for different pain syndromes and inflammations, then, you know, these are, effective but they're not without risk and people underestimate the risk i guess that's my point we talked a lot tonight about the the, the 16,500 people who die every year in the u.s from gi bleeds from NSAIDs. did anybody know that the 15th leading cause of death did anybody know that even baby aspirin could put you in the hospital for gi bleed did anybody know that well now you do and now you know the role of, of, of receptor specificity in mediating those effects, which is the message I want you to take going forward as you become researchers, academicians, clinicians, scientists, teachers. Really important. Uh, let me see. Let's see. Uh, yeah, people did not know that. No, I, I didn't know that until I was working in this field either. So. You dig in, you learn stuff. Okay, students, we're at time. So unless there's anything else, we'll close it down. Are the side effects downplayed on purpose? I, I have a hard time. G given what happened with, with Vox and Celebrex, I, I have a hard time believing that anything's being hidden anymore. I, I don't see that. I don't see that in my work. You know, I don't see that in, in my work with industry. I see a lot of people who are ethical, who want to do the best for their companies and for patients. So I, I'm not, I don't have that um, dark side. I have a question. Would it be worse for someone who's on a blood thinner like Eliquis to take um, a general NSAID like, like aspirin or a COX-2 inhibitor, or would it be the same? So there is definitely an increased um, rate of GI bleeds for patients who take NSAIDs with anticoagulants. I, I have one of the slides actually speaks to the increased risk early on. So for those patients, a COX-2 specific inhibitor like Celebrex meloxicam would be preferential to reduce the risk if they're on a 10A inhibitor for you know uh, atrial fibrillation or something like that. Okay. 
Okay. Excellent questions. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you all tonight. This is this is exactly what I I hope with these courses that you guys just you know let's talk for 20, 30 minutes before the lecture. Let's talk through the lecture. Jump on the bulletin board if you want during the week. I'll monitor it. Um, you guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night.